Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number 12, Earth's Closing Events. Ready for teaching on June 22, the author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you for all of your good gifts to us, and particularly for your word and what your word tells us. It tells us that you created us, you saved us, and Jesus is coming again for us. But it also tells us that there are things that will happen before that time. And as we wait, we need to be close to you, because we know that salvation is by grace. It's by the salvation that is offered through Jesus and his death on the cross. But each of us can access that freedom, that grace, that salvation. And as we open your word today, we pray that we may remain assured of your love and your kindness and your grace toward us as we face the various difficulties of life and what will come towards the end of time. Now, as we open your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us, not just in our study of the word, but in our personal lives as well. And today I'd like to particularly mention Madeline Abraham from Antigua and Bermuda, and also Mary Sue Burge and Ella Dismuke. Lord, I don't know their personal needs, but I pray for them today. And also for all those who are visually impaired in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia and Western Australia, and those in North and South New Zealand. Lord, there are many people around the world who listen to this reading of the adult Sabbath school lesson. And as we do so, we pray that each of us may be blessed and that we may be a witness to those around us. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Let's read that again. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Suppose you had a daughter driving home from college for summer vacation. As you wait for her to arrive, you anxiously monitor the weather reports. You become worried as the weather rapidly deteriorates. Storm clouds loom on the horizon. Winds blow fiercely. The heavens open and rain pours down. Trees are blown over. Soon the main road home is impassable. Then you hear from one of your neighbours that it is possible to get through on a secondary road. Cars can navigate around some down tree limbs. Although communication is difficult, you are able to get a text message to your daughter and carefully detailing how she can get home safely. More than anything else, Jesus wants to take us through the storms of life and get us home. Ellen G. White writes in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 315, A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? End of quote. The purpose of Christ's life, death, resurrection and ministry in heaven's sanctuary is to ensure that we get home. The prophetic messages of Daniel and Revelation are divine instructions especially for an end-time people, to help us through life's storms so that one day we can feel the warm embrace of a loving Saviour. The aim of this week's lesson is to reveal what the prophetic word says about the closing events and discover a new Christ's strength to take us through earth's final conflict and get us home. Sunday, June 16, Loyalty to God and His Word. Read Proverbs 23, verse 23, John 8, 32, and John 17, 17. What common thread runs through these verses? 
Proverbs 23, 23, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction and insight as well. John 8, 32, Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And John seventeen seventeen, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Throughout the ages, the great controversy has been a battle between truth and error. Satan is a liar and the father of lies, we read in John 8.44. Jesus is the author of all truth. He declared in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the light. The truth that sets us free from Satan's deception is found in God's word. The Bible unmasks Satan's strategy and reveals God's plans. Scripture is a lamp to our feet, as you read in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. The psalmist declares, The entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple, in Psalm 119, verse 130. He then adds, The entirety of your word is truth, in verse 160. Read Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. What assurance does the Apostle give us regarding prophecy? What illustration does he use to show the importance of God's prophetic word? Second Peter 1, beginning at verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but... We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. The prophecies of God's word light up the road ahead. They help us distinguish truth from error. Without the Bible, we would be left to the whims of human opinion and easily be deceived. We read in the Great Controversy, page 593, the people of God are directed to the Scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible, for its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvellous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defence of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? End of quote. And so to finish the day, consider the questions in the quote above. What will enable us to stand in the final crisis? What distracts us from studying God's word? How might we be compromising truth for personal pleasure? Monday, June 17, Sealed for Heaven In the coming crisis over worship, God's faithful people will not yield to worldly pressures, as we read in Revelation 14.12. 
This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. They will be sealed by the Holy Spirit, we read in Ephesians 4 verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption and cannot be moved. In ancient times, seals attested to the authenticity of official documents. They were a distinctive, individualised mark. Since the final conflict centres on worship and God's authority as revealed in his law, we would expect God's seal to be embedded in his law. As we read in Ephesians 8.16, Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instruction among my disciples. Read Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 10. What elements of a seal are contained in the Sabbath commandment? Exodus 20 beginning at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Here we have three elements of an authentic seal. One, the name to whom the seal belongs, the Lord thy God. Two, his title, the one who made the Creator. Three, and his territory, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. A seal is sometimes called a sign in the Bible. Romans 4 verse 11, And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. The two words are interchangeable. As God's sign or seal in the heart of God's law, the Sabbath is at the centre of the final conflict over worship. As we read in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, Also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us, so they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. And verse 20, Keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And Revelation twelve seventeen. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Compare Revelation 7, verse 1 and 2, and Revelation 14, 1, with Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. Where are the seal of God and the mark of the beast received? Why do you think there is a difference? Revelation 7, verse 1. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land, or on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. And Revelation 14.1 Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And Revelation 13, beginning at verse 16 It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. The seal of God is placed on the forehead. The forehead is a symbol of the mind and represents a conscious decision. 
The mark of the beast is received either in the forehead or in the hand, indicating that people are convinced intellectually and by their own choice accept Satan's lies, or alternatively, they conform to false worship to avoid being killed. The devil hates those who are obedient to God. The great controversy comes to a climax when the dragon, that's Satan, wages war on the believing remnant who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in Revelation 14.12. They are settled in their loyalty to Christ. And so to finish today, why is day-by-day faithfulness to the Lord the key to being prepared when the final crisis arrives? Tuesday, June 18, Whom Do We Worship? In the last days, the great controversy will be played out in a dramatic way over worship. Do we worship the Creator, or do we worship the beast and its image? There is no middle ground. The first angel of Revelation 14 urges men and women to worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Revelation 14 verse 7. In further support of heaven's appeal, the third angel reveals the dire consequences of worshipping the beast. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Revelation 14.10 By contrast, those who worship the Creator are described as keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in Revelation 14.12. Creation is the basis of true worship. We read in Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Since God created all things through Jesus Christ, as we read in Ephesians 3.9, Satan hates the Creator and has attempted through earthly powers to change the Sabbath, the memorial of creation. As we read in Daniel 7.25, He will speak against the Most High and oppress His holy people and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into His hand for a time, times and half a time. The coming conflict over the law of God focuses on authority. If Satan can eradicate Sabbath worship, he will declare that his authority is greater than God's authority. To accomplish this, Satan will attempt to convince or coerce the entire world to accept a counterfeit Sabbath. However hard it may be now to see this happening, as we've noted before, the world is changing dramatically. The COVID-19 crisis showed us that overnight our world can become a different place. Though we don't know the details that lead to the mark of the beast, it's not terribly hard to imagine. The world is very unstable, and with the amazing technology out there now, what the Bible warns about can indeed come to pass more quickly than we might now imagine. Read Revelation 13, verses 13 to 17. What specific penalties are inflicted upon those who do not receive the mark of the beast? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 13, And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Those who are faithful to Christ, as opposed to following the beast and its image, 
will face economic penalties as well as the threat of death. Humanity remains what it has always been, corrupt, power-hungry and violent. However much we don't yet know about exactly how the final events will unfold, it should not be too hard to envision end-time persecution. Though written in another context completely, these words in John say it all. Talking about Jesus, John wrote that he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man, in John 2 verse 25. And so, to finish today, think about the corruption of humanity and the evil that humans are capable of doing. Why does this show how easily final events could come about? Also, even more important, what should this sad truth teach us about guarding our own hearts? Wednesday, June 19, The Early and Latter Rain Read Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 27, and Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and 41 to 47. What prediction was fulfilled in the first century? What impact did it have? First of all, Joel 2, beginning at verse 21. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain, the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. And Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound, like a blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then chapter 2 of Acts, verses 41 to 47. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost powerfully launched the Christian church. Three thousand were converted in a day. Acts records miracle after miracle of God's transforming grace. Chapter 4, verse 4 reads, Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Only 120 believers gathered to pray, but prayer made a dramatic difference. Rapidly the church added thousands of believers. Even a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith, we read in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Yes, even many priests became followers of Jesus. When the disciples were fiercely persecuted in Jerusalem, they went everywhere preaching the word, we read in Acts 8 verse 4. Churches were planted throughout all Judea, Samaria and Galilee, we see in Acts 9.31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. 
After his conversion, the Apostle Paul proclaimed Christ throughout the Mediterranean world. In Thessalonica, some Jews opposed to the gospel made this astonishing statement recorded in Acts 17 verse 6. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. What a powerful testimony to what the early church was able to accomplish. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples reached the then known world in a relatively short time. Joel's prediction of the early rain was fulfilled at Pentecost, but the latter rain will fall with greater power to ready earth's final harvest. Read Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, chapter 10 verse 1, Hosea chapter 6 verse 3, and James chapter 5 verses 7 and 8. According to these verses, how will the work of God on earth be finished? Zechariah Chapter 4 and verse 6. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. Ask the Lord for rain in the springtime. It is the Lord who sends the thunderstorms. He gives showers of rain to all people and plants of the field to everyone. And Hosea chapter 6 verse 3. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. And James 5, beginning at verse 7. Be patient then brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. The terms early and latter rain are taken from Israel's harvest cycle. The early Rain fell in the fall or autumn of the year to germinate the seed. The latter rain fell in the spring to ripen the harvest. This describes the work of the Holy Spirit for the proclamation of the gospel. In the Great Controversy, page 611 and 612, we finish today's reading. As the former rain was given, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel, to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. Thursday, June 20, The Loud Cry Read Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, and Matthew 24, verse 14. How do these verses say God's work on earth will be finished? Let's start with Revelation 18 and verse 1. After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive of any of her plagues. And Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And Matthew 24 and verse 14, and that reads, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The angel announcing the fall of Babylon has great authority like the angels of Revelation 14. This angel represents human beings. This angel reveals the glory of God so fully that it illuminates the entire earth. 
The Greek word for authority or power in the New Testament is exousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A. It often refers to Christ's triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. Jesus uses this word in the Gospel of Matthew in harmony with the sending out of his disciples. In Matthew 10.1, Jesus gives his disciples authority over the principalities and powers of hell. The verse reads, Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Jesus gives his disciples authority over the principalities and powers of hell. He sends them out with the divine power to be victorious in the battle between good and evil. In Matthew 28, he once again sends them out with all authority in heaven and on earth to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Let's read those verses, Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, going forth with the authority of the living Christ, who in his life and death triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell, the New Testament church lightened the earth with the glory of God. In a few short years, the disciples proclaimed the gospel to the then known world, as you read in Colossians 1.23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. At the end of time, the Holy Spirit will be poured out in unprecedented power, and the gospel will be spread rapidly to the ends of the earth. Thousands will be converted in a day, and God's grace and truth will impact the entire planet. In this way, the world will be warned, and the gospel and the hope it offers will be spread worldwide. The great work of the gospel we read in The Great Controversy, page 611 and 612, is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. And so to finish today, what is holding back the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, and the loud cry? However small our role as individuals might be, What role can we fill in being open and receptive to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Friday, June 21. Further Thought As early as 1851, Adventist pioneers identified the second beast of Revelation 13 verses 11 to 17 with the United States of America. But it must have been difficult back then to see how the United States could cause all the world to worship the first beast in verse 12. Even by the 1880s, the entire United States Navy consisted of just 48 ageing ships. But, since the end of the Cold War, no power matches the United States militarily. And though Americans have enjoyed wonderful freedoms, as times get harder, it's not difficult to see those freedoms being trampled on, or even completely undermined. Many believe that even now we are seeing this happen. From the Great Controversy, page 604, we read, All who refuse compliance in observing the false Sabbath will be visited with civil penalties, and it will finally be declared that they are deserving of death. 
On the other hand, the law of God enjoining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. End of quote. And then from page 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, their apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Why is an understanding of last day events so important in the coming crisis? How are scriptures a safeguard from deception? 2. Democratic societies worldwide have been bastions of religious freedom for centuries. How might that change rather quickly? 3. Look at Ellen White's statement above. What choices are you making today that could result in your being with those professed Adventists tomorrow? And four, how does the second angel's message change under the loud cry and what personal preparation can we make for receiving the latter rain to finish God's work on earth? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Reaching Russian Speakers by Andrew McChesney Ukrainian national Vadim Krinichny moved to Portugal to install air conditioners. Two decades later, he was ministering to the needs of Ukrainian refugees as the pastor of a Russian-speaking church in Spain. What happened? We started with just a few members, but our church has become a centre of influence for many, said Vadim, for age 44. This is a blessing from God. After leaving Ukraine, Vadim and his wife, Alina, established a successful air conditioning business in Portugal and obtained Portuguese citizenship. But 12 years into their new life, their path changed abruptly when they were asked to help a newly arrived family who didn't speak Portuguese. Vadim and Alina invited the Russian-speaking family to attend church with them, and the family also accepted an offer to study the Bible together. Three months later, the family gave their hearts to Jesus in baptism. Vadim and Alina were delighted, and they sought out more Russian speakers to help. In 18 months, they formed a house church of 20 people. Vadim preached every Sabbath, and Alina oversaw the music. On Saturday evenings, we were exhausted from the day's activities, Vadim said. But we were filled with an inexpressible satisfaction, joy and happiness. The couple sensed that God was calling them to a new purpose. Their sole desire was to win souls for God's kingdom. Closing their business, they moved to Sagunto Adventist College in neighbouring Spain. Vadim graduated four years later with a master's degree in theology. Vadim formed a group of 20 Russian speakers that met every Sabbath afternoon for Bible studies, while he worked as an intern pastor in Valencia, a city near the college. Visitors to the group were invited to church. Before long, about 10 visitors were attending church services regularly, and the Sabbath afternoon group kept growing. We noticed that people had a need to gather with their own language group, Vadim said. When the number of Russian-speaking church members reached 26, a Russian-speaking church was born in Valencia with the support of the Adventist Church in Spain and the Inter-European Division, whose territory includes Spain. Our idea was to serve all Russian-speaking people, no matter whether or not they are Russian citizens, and to bring them to Jesus, Vadim said. God has abundantly blessed us in our mission. 
Your 13 Sabbath offering next Sabbath will help spread the gospel in the Euro-Asian division, the home of many Russian speakers. Thank you for planning a generous offering. This mission story will conclude next week.